Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn. Have you ever reached a turning point of faith? Join us now on the Grace Pipeline to see what the Bible has to say about it. Welcome to the Grace Pipeline, a series of Bible studies that focuses on the overriding theme of God's grace from Genesis to Revelation. All things come to us from our Heavenly Father of love through His pipeline of grace. And since it is by faith that we tap into this Heavenly Pipeline, we have spent our last two programs broadening our understanding of faith's definition. Today, we will consider two great faith stories from the New Testament, one that even surprised the Lord Jesus Christ and another who made the right turn when he reached the turning point of faith. If you're following along in the series companion book, also titled The Grace Pipeline, we're beginning from chapter 10 as I share the Bible account that it has amazed me since I was a young girl about the one incident of faith that caused the Lord of glory to marvel. Reviewing this event will enrich our understanding of faith. Matthew and Luke both recorded the story with emphasis on different aspects. Matthew summarizes, omitting the mention of people who are speaking on behalf of another, but he includes Christ's warning to the Jewish nation. Luke, on the other hand, addresses a different audience and provides a more detailed report, but omits the concluding warning. I will borrow from the parallel accounts found in Matthew 8 and Luke 7 to tell my amplified version of the story, drawing on scripture and personal interpretation of historical implications. My account of the story of the centurion and his slave goes like this. Drenched with sweat and growing weaker by the moment, a centurion servant lie paralyzed on his pallet. He had writhed in torment for days. He could not lift his limbs. His life energy was slowly draining. So returning home, his master learned of his condition and entered into the room to survey the situation. Without doubt, death was hovering over his dear servant, silently waiting to steal him away. There was only one hope. The Roman centurion had heard reports of Christ's miracles, and he was convinced that Christ was God's representative on earth. Immediately, he sent word to the elders of the local synagogue and requested they act as his ambassadors to ask Christ to come and heal the servant. The elders received the request, instantly dropped what they were doing, and they set out to find Jesus. The centurion was a gentleman Gentile. He loved the Jewish nation, and he had proven to be their friend. They had hoped to make him a proselyte, although he had yet to be circumcised. He had accepted the tenets of their religion, and he generously provided the funds to build the local synagogue. He deserved their help. His, fellow, his favorite servant was dreadfully ill and ready to die. Time was short. They hurried. Walking in swift strides, the elders spotted Jesus coming down the road with his disciples, and a throng of people were accompanying him. Christ had just concluded his Sermon on the Mount, and he was returning to Capernaum. The people who followed had been amazed by the authority with which he spoke. He set a higher standard of righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees taught or practiced, and he stirred an emotion in their heart to hear more of his sayings. The delegation of elders sprinted toward Christ and his entourage. Breathlessly but zealously, they spoke on behalf of the centurion. Sharing his message, they urged Jesus to go to this Gentile's home. I can only imagine how the disciples' eyes darted from one to another, wondering what Jesus would do. In their culture, it was socially unacceptable for a Jew to enter the home of a Gentile. Now, Although Jesus held no such prejudice, he was sensitive to avoid offending his nation when possible. On the other hand, 
Jews were under the authority of the Roman government and required to submit to their officers' commands. So this message from the dear centurion was worded more as a heartfelt request, one that the compassionate Christ could not refuse. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Christ went with them, and the crowd of Jewish believers followed in curiosity. As they neared the house, the centurion glanced out the window, and he saw the group approaching, and he realized that he was placing the Lord in a position that could bring contempt upon him for entering a Gentile's home. Because he was uncircumcised, the centurion was not even permitted to participate in the synagogue services. How, he thought, could he consider himself worthy to have this great man under his roof? He hastened his friends and he sent them out the door to deliver a message to Jesus, to turn back, recognizing Though the humble heart of the Roman centurion, Jesus continued to walk. And as he advanced, the centurion rushed out to meet him. And according to Luke 7, verses 6 through 8, this is what he said to Jesus. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I do not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. This military man understood the authority of a command. He carried out the orders of his superiors, and he expected those under his charge to execute the word of his instructions instantly. Believing that Christ was the commander of the universe and carried heaven's authority over illness, he made a comparison between Christ's position and his own. The centurion was convinced Christ could just speak the word and it would be done. Hearing these things, Jesus marveled at the magnitude of his faith. The Lord's heart overflowed with the joy of acceptance and genuine astonishment. This man had not heard him teach personally. He had not witnessed any of the miracles he had performed. The Roman soldier had only received second-hand reports of his teachings and his works. Still, the centurion believed what most of the Jews who had been privileged by personal contact with Christ had not believed. And the Lord, who measures a man's greatness by the measure of his faith, turned around to the crowd that followed him, and he spoke these words from Matthew 8, 10 through 13, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Christ rewarded the Roman soldier with his approval, and the centurion's faith released the grace of a miracle. His servant was healed. This he was assured of without even seeing the evidence for himself. His heart welled with gratitude for the Lord, and at the nearby home, the servant felt a stream of energy flood his body, and he opened his eyes. He stood to his feet with restored strength, but could not comprehend the amazing reversal of his condition. So the committee that the centurion had sent, his friends who'd gone to Jesus, they hurried back to verify the healing. And entering the room, they discovered the man looking vibrant and feeling hungry. The miracle had occurred without Christ being present at the moment of healing. Now, 
In the meantime, I wonder what the Jews who were pressed in around Jesus were thinking of the precept that he had just revealed. Surely their minds were spinning. They commonly referred to themselves as kings or sons, excuse me, sons of the kingdom, believing that their heritage gave them a natural right to all of God's privileges. Why would Christ suggest that they would be cast out into outer darkness? These Jews recognized Jesus' obvious approval of the centurion. They surely wondered if he referred to the Gentiles when he said, many will come from east and west to sit with the patriarchs in God's kingdom. Did they realize he meant only the spiritual children of God will be in heaven, whereas the natural children of Jewish lineage would be excluded unless they were born again? Christ's words condemned those who did not have personal and active faith in him. And he repeated the same symbolic language of destruction in a parable recorded in Matthew 22. There we find him sharing the illustration of a king who had arranged a marriage for his son. Many of the privileged on the king's guest list refused the invitation. But the monarch found others to come to the marriage feast. And at the wedding supper, the king noticed a man seated at the table who was not wearing the appropriate wedding garment, which is symbolic of Christ's robe of righteousness. Christ said in the parable, the man was seized and cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This symbolism represented the final destruction of those who would not repent and receive his righteousness. The Lord concluded the parable with this word to the wise that's found in Matthew 22:14. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. In the centurion's account and the wedding parable, as now, Christ cautions all who think they have gained entrance into the kingdom of heaven to examine their lives and see if they are in the faith. Inspired by God, Paul repeats the warning in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse five, saying, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Likewise, we all need to test ourselves to examine our lives and see if Christ is in us and to see that we are in him so that we will not be disqualified. Traumatic events lead the way to turning points in our life. When an emergency, a tragedy or catastrophe strikes, we commonly experience a personal identity crisis. The root of the problem can be physical, financial, relational, or spiritual. But whatever the cause, our circumstances can create emotional and mental turmoil. How humans handle our crisis depends largely on our degree of faith in God. In many instances, unbelievers are brought to their knees by fiery trials, and they look up for the first time, turning their eyes to the living God. And as he reaches down, with a soothing touch to relieve their blazing anguish, a trust is born within their hearts that generates the development of active faith. So drawing on God's power of grace, they climb out of the fiery pit. But in sharp contrast are the instances of believers whose experience of faith could be compared to the balancing act of sitting on a two-legged stool their faith constantly wavers and it requires propping up by positive circumstances. So when the scorching trial comes, weakening one of the wobbly legs that supports their faith, they turn away from God and turn and fall and stumble into the smoldering ashes. Now finally, there are those devout believers who endure the testing of their genuine faith amidst the fiery trial, and such testing produces per patience that perfects their character. Grieved by their circumstances, 
they turn to God in total trust with minds focused on him rather than the problem. And they walk in his promised perfect peace. Christ serves as their heat resistant crucible and they emerge from the fire with faith as pure as gold. The very religious Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul experienced the turning point of faith in his life and his career when he had an encounter with Christ that produced genuine faith and it reversed his direction. He vividly describes his conversion to King Agrippa in Acts 26, 9 through 23. Paul shares how his former great ego and his devout sense of duty caused him to be hostile toward the name of Jesus of Nazareth and his followers. This Pharisee of Pharisees served as the official persecutor of the saints under the authority and the commission of the Sanhedrin. His religious ambitions caused him to carry out a ruthless campaign to rid the world of what he considered heresy. One day, traveling at high noon on the road to Damascus, he was confronted by Christ. A supernatural blinding light, brighter than the sun, shined around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice that said, as recorded in Acts 26, 14 through 16, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. In his message to the misguided Saul, Christ used a proverb common to the culture of the day to kick against the goads, the goads, pictured an ox's leg being pricked by a sharp iron goad that was carried in the hand of the plowman and it was used to gain the attention of the slow moving creature to quicken his pace. But when the ox kicked against it, the wound would become more severe. Christ's words suggest the Holy Spirit had been trying to reach the heart of Saul, but the religious zealot had repeatedly resisted him. Let you and I also be mindful not to sin against the Spirit by resisting him. Anyway, as the Lord continued to speak, he let the legalistic Saul know he was sending him to minister to, of all people, the Gentiles. What was his purpose for sending him? Christ reveals that in Acts 26, 18. He says, I am sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Faith has sanctifying power, the power to set us apart for God's purposes, turning us away from sin and making us holy. Saul had reached the point of a spiritual identity crisis. With his massive ego, he could have turned to God, becoming only devoted to the cause of Christ. But Saul's turnaround changed him to Paul, who was devoted to the person of Christ. Responding to his Savior, he was separated that day to the living God. The profound relationship that he developed with the Lord was like that of a child to a father, one of absolute dependence upon God and his grace. So as Paul's beliefs changed, Paul's faith was purified and his character was miraculously morphed, producing a total transformation. Paul was obedient to the heavenly vi vision and putting faith into action. Acts 26, 20 says that he went about teaching all who would listen to repent and turn to God and to do works befitting repentance. Now this message did not refer to works that attain righteousness 
for Paul taught that that result was impossible, he referred to the righteousness of Christ, which results in putting faith into action. Paul suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. And he said in Acts 20, in verse 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Christ's most enthusiastic evangelism of grace, his most ardent ambassador for righteousness by faith, was also his greatest preacher on sanctification, the character transformation that all of us need. Paul experienced God's supernatural work in his own life, attributing his sanctification to grace and active faith. And Paul's great boast of grace is written in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, where he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul listed the armor of God that Christians should put on to fight against evil forces in this dark world. And he presented truth, righteousness, and faith as three powerfully protective pieces, saying in Ephesians 6, 14 and 16, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, in another letter to the churches, he depicts the armor of faith differently. He writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul's first message describes how faith in God's character, his word, and his ability to perform his promises shields us against the attacks of the wicked one. But how do we understand his dual illustration of the breastplate of righteousness as being interchangeable with the breastplate of faith and love? Actually, it is easily explained. Faith is the instrument by which we attained Christ's righteousness, resulting in our reception by faith of the indwelling Holy Spirit who pours out God's love into our hearts. The attributes of righteousness, faith, and love are inseparable, and they are God's armor to protect our hearts. By faith, we are flooded with grace, purifying and cleansing us of sin. Paul writes in Romans 1, 16 through 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, when Paul learned the truth of Christ's death and resurrection, and he experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, then he gave his life to God and became God's evangelist of grace. The good news of salvation, Paul explains in Romans 4, 16, is that it is of faith that it might be according to grace. The cause of salvation is God's grace, and it becomes ours when we tap into his grace pipeline by faith and accept God's three greatest gifts of grace, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the scriptures. The righteousness of God is from faith to faith. Righteousness is a gift of God accessed by faith. It begins and ends with faith. Our relationship with Christ gains us access by grace 
or access to grace by faith. Paul assures us of this in Romans 5, 1 and 2, where he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Faith is the faucet. This is how we tap into grace and we desperately need to develop our faith. The afflictions and the tribulations of the life on earth caused by the controversy between good and evil will increase dramatically as the time of Christ's second coming draws nearer. And we already see it. To face these situations, we are going to need a flourishing faith, a faith that will gain us the victory won in Jesus. We have reached a turning point. Which way will we go? I want to say a quick prayer with you. And I want you please to join us next time because we're going to discuss how you can take seven steps to develop victorious faith. But right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us grow in grace, to grow in faith. Father, we come in the name of Jesus, approaching you boldly as your children, coming before your throne of grace. And Father, I lift my brothers and my sisters before you and myself as well. We have come, Lord, to ask us, to ask you to help us, Lord, increase our faith. We believe, help thou our unbelief. I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that you will give us an unquenchable desire for your inexhaustible word. And I pray the word will be planted in our heart and by the power of the Holy Spirit, faith will spring into action. Lord, I ask this in Christ's name and we receive it in Christ's name. Amen. Join us next time on the Grace Pipeline as we see the different seven different steps that can help us gain victorious faith, faith that will flourish in any circumstance and faith that will change your life. We want to be like the centurion. We want to be like Paul. We want to be able to say, Lord, you have spoken the word and we know it's going to be done. Lord, you have called to me and I will turn to you and be devoted to your purposes. Until then, we pray that you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.